Okay, we're back. We're live. It's Wednesday morning. It's 11 o'clock. It must be Trump week, which is a very important day. But let me say every day is a very important day for Trump so, and the country. So here we are with uh, Tim Apatella here in the studio. Uh, and we have uh, Cynthia Sinclair. Uh, she's remote. I mean, she's remotely located. She's not remote as a person. Okay. So <laughs> lots of stuff is going on here today. I mean, tons of stuff. As a matter of fact, I'm driving in a minute ago. And there it is, that these constitutional lawyers, four in a row, I think it is, all opining on the Constitution. That was really powerful. And the Republicans had a chance to cross-examine them, and that was interesting. Interesting, the arguments they came up with. So, uh, Tim, what do you think? Did you have any chance to watch it? I woke up very early again this morning. Um, yes, I have watched it. And, uh, you know, history's being made. and. You know, I see comparisons to the Nixon hearings, um, but I see even more of a partisan divide. And um, I find that very discomforting. I do, too. Uh, Cynthia, you've been watching it. I know you have. Because uh, yes, when I we have. started setting up for the show, I could hear it in the background in your room there. So let's talk about what's going on right now, this instant moment in those hearings. Well, I turned it off when I came down to sit in front of the computer. So I don't know at this moment, um, but right at this point in time, they've already gone through all of the chairman's questions and the Democratic uh, attorney's questions, the Republican uh, ranking member's questions, and then, um, and then their lawyer's questions. And now they're doing the five minutes, five minutes, five minutes, going back and forth between Republicans and Democrats. Mm -hmm. And you're right, there were four um, law professors that were there. Three are unanimously in favor of impeachment. And one says that he's against it because he doesn't think there's enough evidence at this point. But he hasn't addressed the fact that the reason we don't have enough evidence is because of the obstruction that's going on. <laughs> What do you think, Tim? Do we have enough evidence? Uh, they do. Um, it would be better to have the evidence of Bolton, McLeany, uh, Giuliani. It would have be very nice to get them all in a room and, and have them tell their story. But since that's obstructions taking place, then therefore we have to go with what we have. Um, can I just read a real quick quote? Because um, Denny Heck, Democrat from Washington State, is retiring. And on his exit, or soon to be exit, he said something I think sums this whole 10 days up, in fact, the whole impeachment process, the whole three years between the Republicans and the Democrats. He said the following, I will never understand how some of my colleagues, in many ways good people, could ignore or deny the president's unrelenting attack on the free press, his vicious character assassination of anyone who disagreed with him, and his demonstrably very distant relationship with the truth. We are simply too many hyperbolic adjectives and too few nouns. Civility is out, compromise is out, all or nothing is in. Denny Heck, Repu uh, representative of the House of Representatives. Democrat. Democrat. Wow. Well, okay, so um, where is this going? How long is this going to happen? I mean, I actually am surprised. I, I thought that they were just going to get onto it. They were going to read the report of the Intelligence Committee and, and write it up. I thought it was going to be pretty simple. But no, they're having a hearing and everybody's getting a lot of a lot of face time and everybody's making a lot of speeches. I, I'm much more persuaded by the Democratic speeches. I think the Republican speeches are as they were in the Intelligence Committee, to, you know, talk about hyperbole. Um, but let's talk about where it goes from here. I mean, how long is this supposed to go? Uh, we, do we know the witnesses going forward? When, it's, uh, when the hearings part is over, what are they going to do? They're going to write it up, I guess, as articles of impeachment, uh, which nobody knows yet what those are. I find that interesting. What's going to happen, Tim? I think it's going to, what we've said before, I think they're going to keep it short and simple as far as the articles of impeachment. You heard the precursor here today. You heard obstruction, abuse of power, and they're going to keep it very short to that. I don't think they're going to bring in any of the Mueller information and testimony in the report, I don't think that's going to enter into this impeachment uh, articles at all. Cynthia, doesn't it enter into it anyway? 
What I mean is, uh, you know, we, we have a, the whole background, a whole milieu, an environment, uh, as uh, Heck said, of hyperbole and unfairness and character assassination, left, right, and center, that has got to affect the minds of the triers of fact. The jury is the house. Um, and it's got to be in the room, even if it's not an official article of impeachment. What do you think, Cynthia? Well, I think the jury is more the Senate, right, than the House. The House will be voting, yes, and holding these hearings, but really the trial happens in the Senate. And so it won't happen until it gets it gets to that point. Mm, that's so an interesting point. I'm really disappointed at this point that they are not going to include the Mueller investigation materials. There were nine counts of obstruction in the Mueller report, four of which could be criminally charged. And the only reason they weren't is because of Neil Kotyal's DOJ memo saying we can't charge a sitting president. So I think it is. Uh, remiss of the Democrats to leave that part out because mm. it's too important. Tim? I, I feel the ultimate judge is not the House of Representatives, not the Senate, but ultimately the voter. And this hearing today, this morning, was for the purpose of the voter to understand what's really at stake here, what's really going on. And for those many, many voters that never was taught a civics lesson in high school, an introduction to what the Constitution and the intent of the Constitution is all about. So you're in favor of having constitutional lawyers telling, in so many words, telling this committee what it should do. This is, you're, you're looking at a Civics 101 class today. These mm -hmm. are professors trained in, in constitutional law, and they are stating it like any good professor knows how to do, how to take a complex subject and translate it for something, for an audience that really doesn't have a lot of exposure to these, these legal, legal and constitutional issues. Yeah, right, as if a, a judge were giving instructions. Um, but you know, uh, some of the constitutional lawyers, in my limited hearing of it, were saying, you should find that there is sufficient evidence. You should vote for impeachment, uh, which I thought was interesting, because that's the ultimate decision to be made. Usually an expert witness is not permitted to do that. Uh, usually an expert witness can give you expert information. He can give you the rules of the game, but he doesn't tell you exactly how you should vote. Some of them are doing that, yeah? I see them advocating for the future of the Constitution of the United States. That's what I saw here this morning. Yeah, I would, no doubt about it. And, I, and frankly, if, uh, if I were on that committee, I'd be happy to hear their opinion on the final decision to be made also. Uh, okay, so let's, uh, let's talk about how this plays. <laughs> You're going to laugh at my question. Let's talk about how this plays in, uh, in Europe. <laughs> I've been watching. Well, you mean before or after NATO? <laughs> I mean, you know, Europe uh, has been, uh, this trip, as all the trips have been, has been a disaster. Mm -hmm. um, I, as I recall, he called Macron uh, two-faced. Two-faced. Two Nothing like calling the leader of uh, one of the long-term allies of the United States back to the revolution. It made the, the, the creation of this country possible. He's calling the leader of that country two-faced. Where does that go? How does that fly? Well, where did it come from? There was a short video about, um, I believe it was Macron, Trudeau, um, Boris Johnson, and the Dutch Prime Minister, Mark Rutter, or Root. Um, they all kind of informally got together in the middle of the hallway. There was a, you know, a camera that had a pretty long distance microphone on it, and they were basically making fun, most likely, of Donald Trump in his 40 minute press conference. And, you know, who, who scheduled that? So they were making fun of him. And, you know, obviously this video now comes in front of Donald Trump, and he's calling Trudeau two-faced. This um, is not good diplomacy, no, it's however you might feel about it. But what it goes to show is that when Donald Trump's not in the room, people are talking about him, and most likely not in the most flattering terms. Yeah, He has come against NATO for so long and against the international cooperation of Europe and, and the United States. What, what should he expect? Well, he's, uh, he's laying tariffs on France. Right. Uh, he's, um, he's pulling uh, uh, U.S. support to NATO. He's doing everything he can to destroy NATO. Um, and he's doing everything he can to insult and disrupt the relationships between the United States and the countries in NATO. Uh, I, I can't imagine this is all, you know, a coincidence or a mistake. It's got to be intentional. 
And you know whose interest it serves? You get one answer. Well, Vladimir Putin. Putin. There you go. All right, Sid, what do you Putin. have to say about that, Cynthia? Well, I want to go back just a little bit, if you don't mind, back and, and address a little bit about these law professors that we've been seeing. We have one from Harvard, one from Stanford, um, one is from George Washington and one, uh, George Washington University, and one is from the University of North Carolina, all from, you know, they're all law professors. But I want to specifically um, give you guys a quote from Pamela Carlin, who's the one from Stanford Law. She was really powerful. And in his opening statements, um, Representative Collins from Georgia, the ranking member, really kind of ripped into these um, these law professors and their ability to address what was going on and what was going to be talked about today. And Mrs. Collins said, I mean, and um, Ms. Carlin said, Mr. Collins, I take offense. I read every transcript from every witness. I would not speak about these things without receiving and reviewing the facts. So I am insulted that you would suggest that as a law professor, I wouldn't care about the facts. But everything I read on these occasions tells me that when President Trump invited, indeed demanded, foreign involvement in our upcoming election, he struck at the very heart of what makes this republic, makes this a republic to which we pledge allegiance. That demand that Professor Feldman just explained constituted an abuse of power. Indeed, as I want to explain in my testimony, Drawing a foreign government into our elections is an especially serious abuse of power because it undermines democracy itself, end quote. Thank you, Cynthia. Now back to the, uh, the main track of our conversation. Um, Sorry. <laughs> we, we have distractions here. Uh, and uh, I think one of the big um, elements of all of this is that Donald Trump will find distractions, create distractions, in order to get the public uh, off the subject of the impeachment hearings and the possibility uh, of impeachment. So can we enumerate the distractions? Well, I think NATO was a perfect playground for that. He, you know, he found people names, uh, you know, taking shots at Macron, taking uh, shots at Trudeau, calling him Two-Face. Um, anything he could do to get the attention off what's occurring right now as we speak. And it's, you know, we've talked about this for the last year, the, the bright and shiny silver object that he wants us all to look at and look away from certain important things. And I, you know, we're right there right now. And, and NATO was his, his springboard to do that. Yeah. Well, everything, mm -hmm. anything to distract us. And what I find in, uh, in Europe is that things really are separating in the sense that there are six countries within NATO that have formed an organization to bypass his sanctions on Iranian oil. Um, I, I don't think they've actually bought the oil yet, but the reason they created the organization was to buy the oil in violation of Trump's sanctions on oil sanctions on Iran. There's uh, your split. <clears throat> well, then you see everything turning. You see. So actually, what I'm saying is, I don't think the distraction in Europe, that trip was unnecessary anyway. Uh, there was no real reason for it. It's it's not a successful distraction. I mean, if you watch him, I don't. Do you think he gains anything by that? I, personally, no, I don't think so. I think again, um, what did he accomplish? I've, I've yet to see the, those accomplishments being, you know, publicized. I don't know. Don't know the answer to that. Yeah. Well, indeed. All we saw was some drama, you know, immature drama, and that's not something we want as a world image for the United States. Right. So uh, Cynthia said that uh, the hearings um, are not really the the the, uh, the hearings are not really the trial. Although Cynthia, I have to say, it really looks like a trial, doesn't it? With all these uh, highfalutin uh, speeches that the Republicans make for five, ten minutes at a time, um, and uh, it looks like a trial in terms of uh, the witnesses. The whole thing in in the House looks like a trial. Now you can say that the real trial is in the Senate. Uh, and indeed, there will be another trial in the Senate. However, it seems to me that we are having the trial that Tim referred to, that is the trial in front of the people now. And therefore, one of the big things that Trump is doing is he's trying to wreck the press. And I really enjoy, be interested in your comments 
uh, on the Bloomberg maneuver a couple of days ago. He's going to exclude Bloomberg from his press conferences, of which there are none in the U.S. Um, so I find it very interesting he's going to exclude them now, as he has excluded others and specific reporters in the past. But what what is your thought about that? Is is that a successful distraction? Uh, what does that mean to the country uh, that we have a major and very, very well, a very high credibility organization, which has been excluded from this theoretical, yeah. theoretical press conference? Well, my answer to that is we had, we had uh, journalists from other credible news organizations, be it NBC or CNN, that their credentials were pulled because they asked a hardball question of the president that he didn't care for. Um, Bloomberg News is a very credible news organization, and he's going to make sure that Bloomberg News doesn't cover anything because he thinks they're tainted. And that's what he's trying to show his base. That again, see, it's fake media. They're going to taint the information. They're going to they're going to skew it to um, poor Bloomberg against President Trump. And you should not listen to him. And I'm not going to let you listen to him. Notice there's a, there's a strange uh, oblique kind of parallel between this and, and Amazon, uh, you know, uh, owned by Bezos, and, and Bezos owns the Washington Post. And the Washington Post is very critical of Trump. So Trump takes away a $10 billion, actually more than that, more than a $10 billion defense contract away by himself, all by himself. You know, it's that sole proprietorship government all by itself. And he did that to punish Bezos, right. to scare Bezos, and I think to scare other members of the press. Um, you know, that if you run against him, if you criticize him, he's going to punish you. And when you get all, through with all this punishment, you get a press that maybe it's a little intimidated. You get a press that's a little more reluctant to talk about him, criticize him. I think that's what he's gunning for. It's not so much a distraction. It's a continuation of his intentional, willful damage to the press. And my own view is I would, I would impeach him for that alone. Cynthia, what would you mm -hmm. do? I agree with you. I think the, that if you look back, when we, we talk a lot about connecting the dots here on our show, and we've talked a lot about the Enabling Act of 1933, was it, or 32? Um, 33. In Germany, uh, 33, yeah, in uh, Germany. And, and just exactly the, the first thing he did was go after the press and, and divide the people. And I think that is a very important thing that we all need to remember. Every single dictator that has ever rose to power starts by assassinating the press um, and controlling the narrative that is being put out. And that's what I see the Republicans doing throughout this whole hearing process from the first ones that were in the Intelligence com in Committee and now these here in the Judiciary Committee. And it seems to me all they want to do is present a false narrative. The only person they ask questions of is the one guy that they like, you know, the um, Turley guy, Jonathan Turley, the guy from the George Washington, because he agrees with them. And so they don't even ask the other guys any questions. You know, like you said, they go on for five minutes with their little speech and then they, you know, that's it. Well, let's let's go to some other strange things that have happened. Uh, Tim, you were interested in the fact that Zelensky uh, seems to be showing maybe some space between him and Trump. What's happening with Zelensky? Well, and at the hearings, they completely um, mischaracterized what he said. Uh, you know, they took his words and basically just, you know, re repackaged them to something he didn't really say. So what did he really say? Uh, if I may, real quick. He said, look, I never talked to the president from the position of quid pro quo. It's not my thing. I don't want us to look like beggars. But you have to understand, we're at war. If you're going to, if you're our strategic partner, then you can't go blocking anything for us. I think that's about fairness, and it's not about quid pro quo. So what he's saying is, look, what you guys call it, what you want to call it, I'm not going to get involved in your your squabbles. You withheld my aid. We're at war. We have, you know. How many thousands of Ukrainians have died trying to keep Russia from invading into the country? That's what he's saying. And he's saying, quit using us as a pawn. Stop treating us like um, we are beggars. And he said, show us some respect here. 
And that is a very powerful message a powerful that this message. very new president has no experience. He's trying to keep his country together. He's trying to fight corruption. And in the process of fighting corruption, he's been involved in corruption. The corruption of the president of the United States trying to extract his uh, you know, announcement about an investigation about the Ukrainian um, hack into the 2016 election and Biden. Yeah, and the, the, the testimony, the evidence that, that has come out, it, it seems to me very clear. Uh, Trump withheld the money, uh, which was critical to the defense of uh, Ukraine uh, and to the foreign policy of the United States, as enunciated by the State Department and Congress in allocating the money, um, in order to benefit himself. Uh, do us a favor, it's an interesting language, do us a favor, um, though, okay? Right. Um, us is a very interesting word. And one of the witnesses this morning, and one of those constitutional law professors, she said, what do you mean, us? And us is the royal we. It's not us. It's him. Do me a favor. So he's putting me uh, in, in him in personally ahead in, in of the interests of the country. Uh, Cynthia, what do you have on that? What, do you agree with that, or, or what's your add to that? I have watched Republican after Republican after Republican throughout this hearing say that they, well, they would try to advance this false narrative that we were just talking about. And what you've just said also, they want to keep trying to say that this was all done for corruption. But in reality, you know, this was done to go after, he didn't say, I want you to go after corruption. He said, I want you to go after the Bidens. And then he came on camera and said, by the way, I want China to do the same thing. I want them to, um, you know, take away some of this power behind Russia was the interfering country in our first election, the 2016 election. And, and that would sort of no. help him. That would help him. And then also the rest of this would help him if yeah. he can discredit Biden, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, I, I, I think the Republicans have to get off their one major defense, and that was, where's the crime? Ukraine, the Ukraine government got the money in the end. Where's the crime? So why is this impeachment even moving forward? That's one of their main points. It's a lot and about I, the law. I, three weeks ago, I used the bank robbery analogy. This morning, you heard other analogies saying, just because you, you know, they didn't get the money and, you know, it doesn't mean a crime wasn't committed. If you rob a bank and you you know leave the sack of money on the table and you get out the door and you're arrested, you're still you're going to be you're going to be prosecuted for robbing a bank. Let me let me uh, go to one other related point, and that is uh, is uh, is the telephone calls that came out this week. Um, they were included in the report of the Intelligence Committee, um, mm -hmm. and we didn't hear about them before. They we only knew about them when the report came out. Uh, those, tele those telephone calls are really important. What do you think? Who is hyphen one? Yeah, I Who don't is know. hyphen one? It's a good bet that hyphen good, one yeah. is Trump. But what do you think of those calls? Mm -hmm. They mean much? Well, we don't know. And again, if you want to spend another six months getting at the, you know, the, the detail of those calls and how they do interplay to this whole thing, fine. But it's going to work against, it's going to work around the, uh, against the Democrats because we're not talking about policies in the election. Um, the Republicans are right about one thing, and it was mentioned this morning, that is, this is all about the speed of which this impeachment is taking place. Well, it is speedy, and it's speedy for a reason, and they cited it because of the 2020 election. Well, that's true. It's happening fast because everyone knows that when you delay tactics by tying things up in the courts and refusing to answer subpoenas for witnesses and documents, you're playing the long, you know, you're playing the end game. I agree. You're absolutely. rope doping absolutely. here. Absolutely. If you don't want to respond to subpoenas. And so the, the Republicans are right. This is speedy for a reason. I agree. Yeah. So let's agree with that. The other thing is, uh, you know, they're, they're playing the cards to say, well, you don't, you don't know actually what happened on the calls. This is not direct evidence. And you can't infer anything from the calls. Well, yes, you can. You can infer a lot from the calls. The calls were, 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 were you have to take them in the context of what else was happening and the people who made the calls. Uh, there's circumstantial evidence of exactly what the Democrats have been trying to prove. So I take them as serious evidence, circumstantial evidence. If I were the judge, I would so advise the jury. This is circumstantial evidence, and it supports the other evidence. What do you think, Cynthia? 
Well, I don't think it is circumstantial. I think that the transcript very clearly states exactly what he expected and what he wanted and what he was going to give them for it. And then we had a number of witnesses that came forward that did say very specifically they heard firsthand. It's not circumstantial. I'm Some not talking about is, the yes. call of July 25th, Cynthia. I'm right, talking right. No, about I know you're the talking five about the or six other calls. calls that are shown in the report right, right. that came out a couple of days right, ago. Right, I, I do understand that, and I'm getting there. Um, what I see with these calls is a very specific connection, and that's one of the things the Republicans have been saying, is that we don't um, have the connection to Trump, but we do. So we have all of these witnesses that have firsthand, not circumstantial, and then we have these telephone calls that connect all of the dots together. And I don't think it's going to take a lot of time to connect those. And so I'm glad they put them in there. And I'm glad that we didn't have them out there before now so that the Republicans could have a chance to create a false narrative to put forward for Okay, it. let's go to one I last can... point. We, we have time for one yeah. last area, and that oh. is uh, uh, your friend uh, Bill Barr. Uh, <clears throat> I like how you put that. There have been there have been interesting news points this uh, this week about that. How he disagrees with his with his own report. Can you talk about that? Well, sure. Um, Michael Horowitz, who's with the Department of Justice, will be publishing a report probably next week about this investigation of of Russia interference in the 2016 election, and his own DOJ is conducting this investigation as per required or requested by Trump many, many months ago, remember? And so um, William Barr disagrees with Horowitz finding that uh, the FBI had enough information in July of 2016 that would justify the launching of this investigation of Russia's interference. So he's already made over, uh, you know, over, overtures on that basic premise of this entire report. So we'll see how that manifests itself um, here in the next week or so. Yeah. how he's going to further communicate his reluctance to, to sign on to this report and or this critical point. Yeah. Well, you know, it seems to me that uh, Trump's initiative uh, about distraction, which we talked about, you know, includes also uh, this phony investigation that he's trying to create into, uh, you know, the origins of the, of the Mueller appointment, the Mueller report. Um, and, I mean, it's really troubling because it's so obvious what he's trying to do: a, create a distraction; yeah. b, um, you know, undermine that report, um, and do an assassination on Mueller and all the people that Mueller talked to, and, and just confuse everybody about everything. You know, investigation here, investigation there. Gum it Let's up. have an investigation. Gum up the works. All over. Gum up the works. You know. Yep. Uh, mm -hmm. So the question is whether that is going to work with the American people. Um, so far, it looks to me like it's kind of a joke that people aren't taking it seriously. Do you think they might be? Well, that's a tough question. It's, it's packed with a lot of sub-questions. And I said it before, I think a, a great portion of this country and the voters are in their silos. It doesn't matter what they hear. They've already made up their mind. Either Trump is, you know, should not be impeached or Trump should be impeached. We're now talking about a very sliver, a, a thin sliver of independent voters or potential Republicans that are disenchanted with Trump that have an open mind to the facts, the data, the evidence presented. So we're not talking about a large slice of Americana here. We're talking very narrow piece. And that will, those people will determine how this thing goes one way or the other. Cynthia, you know, it seems like we've, we've come to the point where um, the jury is the public and the public includes the base. And the base may be more you know, forceful perhaps than uh, than the wallflowers who sit and watch uh, to observe. And I guess the question is, do you, do you think that if there was a real mistake, a, a tactical error by Trump in, the, in these distractions, or a tactical error by him in foreign policy, which I think he's fully capable any day, um, it, could that change the way uh, the jury, so to speak, including the base, uh, will vote? And when I say vote, I mean talk to their representatives in the Senate. Do you think there's any hope of that, or do you agree with Tim? Oh, goodness. Well, I, I always try to hold out hope, right, that there's hope for our country and that, that these Republicans will try to put forward their um, country over party 
And right now, what I see is a bunch of Republicans with smug looks on their faces, not interested at all into what the facts are that are involved. All they care about is, you know, presenting their false narrative. And that's the part that really worries me. And we have to remember in the Nixon impeachment, his base stayed loyal all the way till the end, even after the Supreme Court had ruled that he had to turn over the evidence that he had, that he was obstructing with. And so, yeah, you know, I don't know. I think a lot of people have drank the Kool-Aid and it's going to be too late for them to ever come back around. Okay, we're out of time, Cynthia. Tim, great discussion. Thank you, Jay. There's plenty of material for next week. I promise you that. Count on it. Count on okay, it. I'm shaking hands with everybody now. <laughs> Aloha, you guys. Aloha. <laughs> Aloha.